In uh, confirmation hearings before this committee in 1982, Judge Bork testified that there was never any possibility that the firing of Archibald Cox would in any way hamper the investigation or the prosecutions of the Special Prosecutor's Office. According to his testimony in 1982, he was faced with a choice. If he refused to fire Archibald Cox, it would create, quote, a very dangerous situation, one that threatened the viability of the Department of Justice and of other parts of the executive branch. Those are his words. On the other hand, he testified, if he moved to contain this dangerous situation by firing Mr. Cox, there would be, quote, no threat to the investigations from the discharge and no threat to the processes of justice. And to support this interpretation of his own decision-making processes, that there would be no threat to the integrity of these investigations from the firing of Archibald Cox, Judge Bork testified that the day after the firing, he met with Cox's two top aides, Henry Ruth and Phil Lacavara, and that he personally, personally assured them that he wanted the Watergate investigation to continue just as before, those are his words, that we would have complete independence and that he would, quote, guard that independence, including our right to go to court to get the White House tapes or any other evidence that we wanted from the White House. Those are quotations from his confirmation hearings, his testimony in 1982. And in the past two weeks, Judge Bork has continued to insist that he did his utmost to keep the special prosecution force together and spent a lot of time trying to hold us together. In the summer of 1973, I was one of several assistant Watergate special prosecutors charged with the responsibility for actually presenting witnesses and documents to the Watergate cover-up grand jury. And I've been asked to testify here today, I presume, to provide some basic factual background from the point of view of those people who are actually working on the investigation day to day that will help uh, the committee evaluate Judge Bork's position on these issues. I think it's important when you consider the question of whether the firing of Archibald Cox affected the integrity of the investigation to recall that after John Dean testified under a grant of immunity in June of 1973 that he had participated in a broad cover-up and that the president had known about and supported that cover-up, that every one of the president's highest aides who could corroborate Dean, every single one, denied Dean's testimony. The president, the White House, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Colson, all disputed Dean. And after the White House taping system was revealed, Mr. Haldeman even testified before the Senate Select Committee that he had listened to some of those tape recordings of conversations between Dean and President Nixon and that the tape supported the President's version, not Dean's. So as of October 15, 1973, John Dean was out on a very long limb. It was his word against everybody else's. Ordinarily, that would have been the end of it. Ordinarily, no one would believe the word of a, a young, ambitious White House lawyer against the President of the United States. But in this very extraordinary situation, we had the opportunity to obtain absolutely incontrovertible evidence, evidence not subject to anybody's rec recollection or bias that would determine who was telling the truth. And it was also the case that that evidence was absolutely essential to any successful prosecution of Nixon's aides. So when you talk about the integrity of the investigation, I think you have to recall that the tapes were the investigation. The investigation had no integrity without the White House tape recordings. Archibald Cox insisted on getting the tapes. The Court of Appeals held en banc that, he was, that the grand jury was entitled to the tapes. He insisted on seeing the court decision implemented rather than accept a forced compromise and he was fired to prevent the tapes from being disclosed. Archibald Cox was not fired because of some personality conflict between him and the president. 
He wasn't fired because the president wanted to replace him with someone else. He was fired to avoid disclosing the evidence. In light of that factual background, I would submit to the committee that Judge Bork's testimony in 1982, that he did not believe that the firing of Cox would have any impact on the integrity of the investigation is absolutely untenable. Second question is, relates to Judge Bork's testimony that within 24 hours after the firing of Cox, he made assurances to us that our independence would be maintained and that we could pursue tapes and documents from the White House. I think as Mr. Ruth set forth the chronology, uh, the facts demonstrate that those assurances were not made and could not have been made. It wasn't until Tuesday afternoon, firing the, uh, following the Saturday night firing, that the President's lawyers stated in court that they uh, would turn over the tapes and that the President had reversed himself. It wasn't until Friday that the President announced that Mr. Bork was going to be allowed to choose a new special prosecutor, but a new special prosecutor who would not be permitted to seek additional tapes and documents. It was not until the following Wednesday, October 31st, that the President backed down on that issue. And he backed down on that issue because Leon Jaworski, his pick to replace Cox, went to the White House and told Al Haig that he wouldn't take the job unless he had at least the same assurances as Cox had had, and that included the right to go after additional tapes and documents. So what you have here in both respects, I think, is a substantial reworking of the facts. More troubling than that reworking of the facts is the attitude that the Watergate events reflect about an uh, attitude of Judge Bork toward unrestrained executive power in the firing of, of Archibald Cox. There were three things that stood in the way of Bork's firing Cox. One was a regulation which had the force and effect of law and which on its face forbid the firing of Cox without a finding of extraordinary improprieties. The second and more important was a, a basic understanding and agreement, which I think, Senator Kennedy, you pointed out this morning, uh, w was made between the executive branch and the United States Senate. It was a pact. It was embodied in that regulation, but it was an understanding between the two branches of government. It was an understanding that the President would permit an independent investigation by a disinterested person in the executive branch to go after the evidence no matter where it led. And it was that understanding which constituted the foundation for the Senate's confirmation of Elliot Richardson, the appointment of Archibald Cox, and the forbearance of the Senate uh, from moving forward on its own special prosecutor legislation, which was under consideration in May of 1973. Now, Judge Bork's position on this is that he, he is not bound by the promise Elliot Richardson made a promise to the committee, and he was not bound by that. And I say in all deference to Mr. Richardson that to treat that promise as a personal undertaking between Elliot Richardson and a few members of this committee is to trivialize it, is to roll the whole Watergate institutional set of institutional problems up into a personal concern. That was not a personal promise. It was an understanding between two branches of government, and it was just as binding on Robert Bork as it was on Elliot, on Elliot Richardson. Now, uh, this committee uh, uh, is faced with a very difficult task to evaluate the entire record of the nominee, uh, including his uh, judgment, uh, his character, integrity, his views on uh, Supreme Court ideology. No one would argue, and I'm certainly not here to argue to you today, that the events of Watergate should be dispositive in anyone's decision on this nomination. But I think the events and the testimony that Mr. Bork, Judge Bork, has given on this issue in the past are part of his record. They're a not unimportant part of the record. And they do at least offer a window, I believe, through which you may view something about the attitudes and the actions of this man. And, when, and the view through that window in several respects is a troubling one, both in terms of the reworking of the facts 
and in terms of the attitude toward executive power that I think it, it betrays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much.